Welcome to a Blood and Pigment faction review. I'm Joseph. I am Guy. And I'm Dan. Today we'll be talking about the South American Tribes, a Native American faction. As a Native American faction in Blood and Plunder, it gets all the special rules for that nationality. They get to use the lay in wait rule with up to half their force when they are the attacker. And all their boats will gain the paddles trait. As a trade-off for all these rules, the Native Americans don't get cannons or any ship larger than a Periagua. This means that they are disadvantaged in most sea games. Trying to win a sea game with Natives is like paddling upstream. It's hard, <laughs> but you can do it. <laughs> As a faction, South American tribes also add elusive to all of their units. Their bow arm units also get to add poison arrows for three points a unit. Poisoned arrows are good in this game, and it's what makes uh, the South American tribes one of my favorite factions, actually. Um, the way they work mechanically is you know, after you shoot someone with poison arrows, um, if they take any resolve tests, they have to re-roll one successful resolve check. Uh, so more likely to fail. They can put down quite a bit of fatigue. I try to buy poison arrows as much as I can with this faction, because if you can put down fatigue... You can control the game by depriving your enemy of actions, which is how they're trying to win. And Joseph, you actually, in your article on the South American tribes, did the math on this ability. I tried. I don't know if it's all accurate, but... I think it was mostly accurate. I, I double-checked you, and it did seem pretty good. Yeah, um, it, I just did simple math. If you have a resolve check of six... You have a 50% chance of passing if you are rolling one dice. 50% chance turns into a 25% chance of passing if you roll a successful and then a fail. Then if you roll that again, then you have another 50% chance of failing. So bringing that down that much makes a big difference on the game. And if you're rolling two dice, you have 50% chance of failing one. And then if you pass the other one, you have 50% chance of failing that one. Again, it's remarkable how fast fatigue can build up. Do you remember that game we played with? Uh, you were playing Olane, and I was coming in with canoes. and all that oh, yeah. Sword on you? <laughs> that was brutal. Yeah, that was um, that was amazingly hard. Yeah, those those Marines I had on the beach never even stood a chance. With no reloads in the bows, they can just do it twice a turn, or even three times if they really want to. Not recommended, but they can shoot. A lot pouring out so much fatigue. That sounds like a massacre. It can be a depressing game for, uh, if things go wrong for the opponent for the South American tribes. Poison arrows also encourage uh, smaller units. Even though it's three points a unit, only one arrow has to hit to have the poison arrow effect uh, happen. So, really, like six man units. Or I've even seen you play five-man units of poison arrow havers are not that bad. Yeah, they're pretty uh, resilient because of their good save, which we'll get to in a little bit. But the bows don't do a lot of damage. They don't kill people very well. If you're in cover, if you're in a ship, your save is six, basically. And then you get a plus a minus three bonus for an arrow. So you're only losing a guy on a one or a two. So 80% of your saves are going to succeed. You don't kill many people. But fatigue is what hurts. So it really doesn't matter if you're rolling 10 dice or 5. If you can get one hit, then you can put the uh, fatigue down. So more smaller units means more little shots, means more fatigue, which means more rerolls of those successes, which means more fails, which means more misery for your opponent. It also makes it really good for shooting at decks of two units, because if you get two hits, then both units have to roll that, and then reroll any successes which means more fatigue and more misery. Yeah, you double your fatigue, just like how uh, expertly drilled is better at shooting at a deck of a ship. Right, and kind of multiply your ability there. All the core units in this faction also have scouts, hidden, and evade. Uh, we've played, when I've played against the natives, hidden has been especially frustrating. It adds plus one to hit, if the attacker is more than 12 inches away from a unit with hidden, and turns off the musket's ability that lets them hit on natural 10s, even if the hit number is 11+. plus. 
takes away Dude. all that extended range. Oh man, that really hurts militia units with a base seven shoot. Oh yeah, yeah. It means they can't shoot unless they're under a foot away. Or they use drilled. They can get their shoot below ten that way. But yeah, you get a plus one for being twelve inches away, and you have a seven to start with. And you have a penalty of three for range, so you're hitting on elevens, which means you can't hit them at all. So I've done this in a couple solo games. I just park in a militia was in a fort defending. Park natives 12 inches away. The militia literally cannot shoot them unless they use the drilled, and then they hardly get any shots off, and the Indians can just keep shooting and shooting. So that means you have to close with them to hit them. But yeah, it's quite a powerful ability. 12 inches is a ways, so you can't get a lot of hits at that range, but yeah. it's, it's fun and frustrating for your opponent. Yeah, 12 inches is a plus two. Under 12 inches is a plus two. So once you do close to 12 inches, you're hitting on a nine with a seven shoot score with militia, but then usually the warrior archers are hitting on sevens because they only have a five. And even though you're more likely to survive an arrow hit, if there's a lot of them that are hitting, you know you're more likely to rack up that fatigue, which will make the unit run away or become great targets for a charge. All the units in this faction also have the scouts ability, which is pretty simple. You just don't take the penalty for moving through terrain so it negates the rough terrain minus one inch so you can move four inches through jungle woods fields rivers etc very good makes you more mobile than your enemy elusive also means that you want to spend most of the hero time in cover right this whole faction gets elusive which is another one of the another reason this is my favorite <laughs> native faction so if you're in cover all units in cover you get a another bonus to your save it's like being a hardcover so you're going to save on fives if you're in cover 60 percent of those hits will be uh, prevented with a save um, mathematically which makes it even more frustrating when you're hidden you don't you're only hitting on tens or nines best even with good sharpshooter units and then most of those hits are getting saved anyway makes these guys really hard to root out at range yeah looking over my notes the poison arrows and hidden are an important part of one of this faction's strengths and main strategies, which is piling on the fatigue and then running into melee. Sort of a poison arrow gambit, if you will. Yeah, that's how I like to play with this faction. You try to keep it range, dump on the fatigue, bribe them of the reload so they don't or get too fatigued on them so they can't defend, and then rush in and maul them. As somebody who's played against native units, especially your native units a lot, it is a mistake if you ever are even 16 inches away, and instead of running away, you decide to go prone. It is a mistake every single time, <laughs> because you'll have, like, at like some, I've, I've done it twice or, or three times, where I'll just have, I think I'm far enough away to go prone to just avoid getting shot, and you'll just end up charging that unit before they have a chance to recover. Charging prone units, it's all over for them. They don't get any saves at all. They can stand up, that's it. They're all dead. That's rough, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> now, in the Poison Arrow Gambit, six-man warrior archer units with a musket sidearm and, po and poison arrows is only 37 points for these six, this kind of effective combat unit. Yep, and they're a great unit. They have that five shoot, so they can shoot from a long ways away, get quite a few hits at medium range at 12 inches. They're still hitting, or 12 to 16, they're still hitting on eights. They're uh, saving on five the whole time. They're a very solid unit. Then, given that musket sidearm, they get that one really powerful, punchy attack. Five shoot, usually worth those four points. You can nickel and dime yourself to death by paying for all these little upgrades. But yeah, I like that 37 point unit. Yeah. That's a great. I, I like to have two of those style of units to dump on fatigue, and then maybe a musket unit, maybe. And then to close the deal, I like to use the warriors, which have quick, so they can rush in, and they have thrown weapons, so they can just destroy a unit or cripple them with one good charge and then skirmish away if you're using the right card. I also like, when I've played this faction, using young warriors without bows. Because those are only three points a unit, or three points a model. Right, they can be a solid melee unit. They have quick as well, don't they? Which is yeah. the same as a train unit, really. Yeah, and giving them... And they also have that five resolve, too. So they have the best resolve other than the African warriors. And 
and only three points a model as a support unit, you can have a unit of 12 of them kind of quickly moving up while you're laying on that fatigue. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be good. I haven't tried that, taking a bow. I like my bow, so I don't take them away, but that's, <laughs> that's an intriguing option. But what do we have for commanders here? Oh, what, do your, what do your notes show for commanders, Dan? So my notes are showing that we got the untested commander, who's one command point at four inches. He only has a melee weapon, so he can only be with melee units. But he also comes with Great Warrior, which means that this commander may not join an experienced unit. Any unit joined by this commander may upgrade all of his units, all of the models in the unit, to War Captains for one point per model. Once per turn, War Captains may apply a minus one bonus to any one test they take. Sounds like strict, but a little better. It does cost one point per model, so again, it's those little extra points you spend here and there add up. It's optional, but I usually try to take it. And it's not that he only can join melee only units. It's he can only ever have a melee weapon. He doesn't even get a pistol like other factions or uh, a bow in this case. He he's only allowed. He only has a club. <laughs> or if you're in my head canon, a McQuedal. <laughs> I really love those things. They are pretty deadly. Yeah, that's a discussion for another time, though. I could go on day how much I love the McQuedal. The next option we have is an experienced commander who is kind of the same thing, but he's got two command points at eight inches, so you're getting double your effectiveness, literally. And he's, once again, only got a melee weapon, but he's got great warrior and inspiring, which is good. Yeah. 15 points for two command points, eight inches, uh, great warrior and inspiring. He gets two, two relevant abilities which is something that not a lot of other factions get at the uh, experience level. He'd be good even if he has it just had Inspiring, but Great Warrior is a nice bonus. Then the third option we have for Vanilla Commanders is the Seasoned Southern Tribes Commander. So he's a little more experienced. Still has two command points, but a 12-inch range. He's got Inspiring, Great Warrior, and Savvy, which means that his unit ignores the effects of Slow Reload and Sound of Thunder. And this has an intriguing combo... The season commanders in general aren't worth it for a lot of factions, but this there are reasons to take this guy. You're, we haven't talked about the Warrior Musketeers much yet, but they're your other core unit besides the Warrior Archers. Uh, they're a four-point musket unit, but they have slow reloads. They take three reloads instead of two, which means they hardly get to they don't get to fire nearly as much. Makes a big difference more than you you might think on the surface. But they're only four points. You can upgrade them to veteran at five points. And then you add this commander to them so they don't have the slow reload savvy. And then you could even go one step further and put great warrior on them so they can take a five shoot. So you have a six point veteran model that has a five shoot with evade and scouts. Uh, that's a pretty impressive unit. And elusive, saving on five all day. Right. It's a lot of money to put into it, but it's a frustrated unit to fight. It's quite good. I did a campaign with this faction, and I got this combo going in addition to adding Ruthless to my custom campaign commander. So I was getting my shoot test down at a marksman, and you can get your shoot test down to a base of three, which is just murderous. People were not happy with me. It was really effective, and you only had eight Warrior Musketeers with your commander at the time, but mm -hmm. if you wanted to do this in a 200-point game, you could put 12 Warrior Musketeers with your, your seasoned um, native commander, and to kind of try maximizing that, uh, that seasoned commander, and then include the same 37-point Poison Arrow units to help because you mm -hmm. it's always good to put fatigue on models the other thing that we haven't mentioned is that command points are great with bow units because mm -hmm. there's no downside for shooting bows shoot again yeah especially i i've seen you with he's in a different faction but king golden cap whenever it's his turn it would be when we played those larger games four <laughs> units would shoot shoot bows Handfuls of dice over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very effective. And you can fire a lot of times on your own turn, but you take a fatigue after 
every shot after your first one. So you kind of want to shoot and move and then use command points to shoot again later. So yeah, command points, very valuable. Those veteran model counts you were saying, how much was it per unit? They start out at four points. The veteran is five. And then if you put Great Warrior on, they can be up to six. So that is tied with my favorite unit, the Interploeg. But while they're an awesome, you know, we already talked about badass boarding unit, they don't have hidden and their shoot is six instead of five. So that's actually really, really competitive, in my opinion. Well, the War Musketeer, their shoot is six, but the Great Warrior, we're going to get down to five. So effectively, it's five. Still, with that commander. that's competitive. That's competitive as all get out. It is. It is really good. Uh, Great Warrior is kind of the southern South American thing that they get. A lot of the North American commanders, I believe, do not get Great Warrior. Yeah, I don't think any of them have it. Yeah, and it is even on the untested uh, commanders, which is kind of a nice bonus compared to other untested commanders. And even though one point a model seems like a high cost, it's usually very much worth it because it's if if you if you had a model if you had a a model that was uh uh five seven five 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 that that sounds like a really good model to take <laughs> and essentially with great warrior you can apply that negative one to a save you can apply that negative one to a fatigue test it it's usually most valuable as a shoot as a a shoot test Mm -hmm. because you want to hit as much as you can it's good to be aggressive in the game but when you're close to charge range you can easily move it over to your your fight so they they're fighting on a on a five you can also use it for scenario specific tests like lighting a fire or spiking a gun or breaking through a fortified building or something. It's very flexible. I should know you can't use it on a save because saves don't happen on your activation. But You're right. So that's all to say the season commander is interesting in this uh, faction. <laughs> it, it's kind of, you don't want to take it unless you're using the all-in on muskets. You're really spending 10 points just for... Four inches and savvy. Savvy doesn't help except for muskets, so you're right. Should we move on to C games here? How, how do they work? All right, so for C games, we're starting to get into my territory a little bit. If you want to take these guys out to C, smaller games or amphibious games are where you want to stick. Nobody wants to be a canoe when it gets hit by a cannon. <laughs> or when your opponent decides to play bumper boats with you. Uh, many scars in my soul here. Yeah, you're so cautious now whenever you play boats and somebody has a ship. <laughs> I know, stay t- 12 inches away. Don't come closer. Stay away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if a boat gets hit by a ship, it's very bad. All your guys fall out. You see, it's canoes. So it can be a very painful way to lose the game. Just keep your boats back. Shoot those poison arrows. Lay of fatigue. And you can shoot with impunity because you get paddles. You don't have to assign anybody to sweeps. So all your boats can basically move three inches forward or back every uh, movement without having anybody assigned to them. Right. Nice. Again, flexible and very action efficient, which is kind of the theme of the natives. If you still want to use natives with ships, I would recommend sticking to, like we said, Dan, 100 point or fewer point ship battles, because that way you're not going to run against a light frigate loaded up with guns you're not going to run up against even like a, a aggressive sloop that can kind of out outmaneuver your boats you're going to be up against you know maybe a sloop but it won't have as many cannons maybe it will only have swivels so you'll have more of a chance to get close lay fatigue on the gun crew and then board i've had good and bad experiences with uh, native sea games of various sizes if the enemy wants to run that's going to be a bad game because you can't really keep up. They have a bigger ship. Their turns can accelerate them. You have to assign yourselves to your oars if you want to even move four. They might be able to even go faster than that. That's going to be frustrating, but at least you have the moral high ground because you can call them a coward. But if they come at you, <laughs> I've had good success. I've had games that ended on turn two because all the 200-point French Buccaneer unit was prone and panicked on the ground, and I was about to board, and he just gave up. <laughs> so if you use your poison, <laughs> right? I like to do a bunch of canoes, 
with again not large units a lot of smaller units with bows you kind of want to spread out your points in my opinion so if those three cannons from the sloop hit a boat it's only a 30 point loss rather than a 40 or 50 point loss uh -huh. um yeah five guys with poison arrows in a boat you have this whole line of canoes you can't hit them all at once just keep dropping fatigue use those command points to shoot more arrows you can't incapacitate a crew you won't kill very many until you get your boarding action in which is risky it's just a very different game quite interesting yeah like you touched on every native c list is a boarding list you always want it your end game is always boarding or depression where they give up <laughs> isn't that the same thing <laughs> <laughs> Some, well, in that particular game, uh, the, the boarding never happened because he threw in the towel. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Those are bad against ships, though. They That hardcover bonus and the, the arrow bonus to saves means that it's negative four. So a, you, if a unit, like a typical sailor that has a seven shoot save, means they're saving on threes mm -hmm. or... Like we, you touched on that earlier. They're saying on threes. If it's a unit that has a good save, like a, a six shoot save, they are saving on twos, which means ten percent of the time your your arrow will kill somebody. It really doesn't feel good. To... So you you really need that fatigue to pile up. So the poison arrows are really essential, in my opinion, which makes this faction decently good at sea, actually. Yeah, it does. Except all of their special rules turn off when they're in a boat. Elusive doesn't work because you're in a structure, a boat. Uh, evade doesn't really work because you can't really... We haven't talked about that one yet, but that's when someone charges you. You can Instead of doing defensive fire, you can take a fatigue to just withdraw four inches, which means they're just left sitting there with their, nothing to hit. But that doesn't really work on ships. It can, but not really. Um... Hidden doesn't work in a ship. If you're in the structure, it turns off. So yeah, all the special fun abilities besides poison arrows don't do anything. So you're just left with firepower and fatigue. And your boats kind of suck too. So yeah, sea games are very different than land games for natives. The other way to have fun with natives at sea is to be the invading force on a amphibious game. Yeah. I... Yeah. You get uh, the bonus of paddles. And you know you're not going to be up against ships. There might be some defensive fortifications that you have to worry about. But paddles make it so you can devote everybody to shooting. And because they're boats and they can't run aground, you don't ever have to slow down your ships. You can ram them into the sand on the beach and not even worry about it. You basically get free cover, free moves, and you can shoot while you're coming in. It's quite a good deal. It's scary, scary impressive sometimes seeing um, a native landing force. I think I've done eight canoes in an amphibious game. That's pretty fun. <laughs> Y'all pretty much touched on everything. There's not much more for me to say. You know, board, hit, hard, basically the way I already play. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta shoot first, though. A lot of shooting first. Yeah, a lot of bows. Bows and arrows are the best way to debilitate a gun crew, though. For sure, yeah, and you want to hit those gun crews early because cannons are not friendly to canoes. But neither are swivel guns. Usually, a ship, if it's a big ship, it gets that uh, elevation advantage on a canoe, and canoe doesn't offer hard cover. So instead of saving on fives like you do on land, if you're in cover, you're saving on sevens, and that is a bad deal. Oh yeah. So incapacitate any cannon or swivel guns if you can. But they, they can be effective at sea if you're careful and the enemy doesn't run like a coward. <laughs> so I think the best way to buy into this faction is to buy the Star Native American Nationality Starter Set. It has eight warrior archers, which is really your bread and butter for this faction, one of your two core units. Eight young warriors, which are very useful too. You mentioned using them without bows, it's just, just as a quick melee unit. As four warrior musketeers, you might want more than that. Might want to pick up another pack. So you have eight. You can use those for a fun command unit or just your hard hitting unit that will actually kill somebody every once in a while. And four African warriors, those are uh, 
support another support unit. unit. Yeah. Okay. We haven't touched on them. The African warriors are a good unit, but they don't share a lot of the core traits that this uh, faction wants to do. And as you've already said, Joseph, you can sink a lot of points into just making an effective fighting force. You don't really need like a six point model already on top of all the other points you're spending half right. the time. They're kind of a general model too. They have decent stats. They have a six, 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 five, they have six fight, six saves, six shoot, six save, five resolve. I prefer to play kind of a specialist force where I have my two units of bows that can put down fatigue and get a lot of hits because they have that five shoot and then maybe one hard, harder hitting unit of warrior musketeers that'll do a couple punchy attacks that'll actually kill people. And then I prefer to use warriors for my support unit, which will run in, maybe even veteran warriors. They can move really quickly with quick and veterans give you two actions so they can do an impressive charge to clean things up. That's my favorite land list. So you might want to pick up some warrior blisters. They don't come in the starter set, but you can actually add bows to those warriors so you could use some of the other models in the box. The models are pretty flexible of the native nationality, really, as long as you are clear what unit, what models are representing. You could use those African warriors for just warriors with bows if you wanted. Or more warrior archers if you want. A mm -hmm. lot of people that I've seen online will proxy the young warriors as warrior archers and even the African warriors as warrior archers. You can mix them in too. Yeah. It gives you 20 warrior archers with this one box. <laughs> right. That obviously has the native commander as well. So, yeah, the nation nationality box is a great place to start. Maybe pick up a couple extra packs, depending on if you want more muskets or some of those warriors without bows. Buying a second starter is also a good idea if you have the scratch for it. Each starter you buy saves you about $10 versus buying blisters. And it will let you play not only the, the South American tribes, but most other Native American factions if you have those two boxes. Yeah, there's not a lot of different models. You kind of customize through paying or removing weapons to make the forces interesting. So yeah, this one box, maybe add a couple blisters, you can play good six or seven factions. Quite a good value. Yeah, and pick up those blisters of uh, regular warriors. Right. Having that second commander could be useful too. You can use him as an officer character which is pretty useful. And I, I've used officers with this faction, and it can work. Get those extra command points, extra bow shots, or a very impressive charge with extra actions on a spade. Or as a grizzled veteran. Right. Grizzled veteran is also... You're, you're going to be using a grizzled veteran most of the time with this faction. You're right. We should have mentioned that. All but, uh, I guess, both of your core units have a resolve of six, which is considered poor. Five is standard. Six is less than good. So you take fatigue. Even if you have that good uh, save, you will be taking fatigue. You might give yourself some fatigue too by shooting bows more than once in one activation. So having a grizzled veteran with the extra rally and tough is a very good choice. I never leave home with the South American tribes without a grizzled veteran. It is one of the few characters that the faction can take. That's right. Natives can't really take a lot of the reformados or Master Gunner or any of those things. Yeah, it's Officer and Grizzled Veteran. <laughs> Spiritual Leader? And, well, yeah, all, all of the non-combatants. They can also take the Standard Bearer and Musician, but those are really not as good because the core units have a musket or bow, and you really want to keep them to keep those weapons. Yeah. So if I, I've already tipped my hand and said that these are one of my favorite factions in the game, so I'm probably going to rate it highly. What would you guys rate the South American tribes as far as power level and fun level among the factions of Blood and Plunder? I'll go first. I would rate this faction I would give them seven, seven stolen muskets out of ten. Mm -hmm. So when I'm looking at the faction, looking again, I don't have a lot of experience on them. I basically know everything that I learned for this video today, looking at our article, reading up on mm -hmm. them. What stands out to me is when I'm looking at a faction, I want to know that it's good 
on both land and sea. If it's not very good at one of them, I want to know how good it is on land. And from what I've seen, these guys are pretty much built to go on land. If you want to do a sea battle, you're very, very limited. So the basis on that, I'm going to go with 5 McQueedles out of 10. Not for a combat effectiveness or anything, because I think on land you're going to be in a much better place. If you're at sea, I think you're in a very precarious position. Because <laughs> you pretty much want to keep those low point values like we discussed, because you don't want to go up against a fully armed light frigate. You do not want to do that. <laughs> that will not end well for you, especially with a very competent sea player. So I'll say 5 out of 10 on the basis that these are pretty much bread and butter for land. And that's what you'll always want to play with these guys. If we ever meet up, I'll take you on that challenge and fight you at sea, just for fun. <laughs> 300 point sea blood and pigment <laughs> battle. <laughs> I can fit a 6 rate fully gunned at 250 points. <laughs> That'd be fun. I am going to give them 10 dead Frenchmen out of 10. <laughs> Two of my very favorite factions. I, I have lost with them maybe once. I'm not sure even once. They're I found them. I find them pretty powerful, and they're just a very different way of playing. They have all the good things about the natives, but none of the bad things. Basically, well, they have some of the bad things. They don't get big ships. They have their abilities turn off at sea. But I've had some just a reload. Yeah. But they don't have Sound of Thunder. Sound of Thunder is the killer for some native factions. It just makes them get fatigued all the time, and they don't have that. And they also have elusive, which makes them very hard to kill. And they have Poisoned Arrows, which is my favorite ability. Um, I will say that if you get quite good at them, or reasonably competent, and the enemy isn't expecting it, it might be a feel-bad game for them. But maybe you're ruthless and you want that. I don't know. <laughs> but I enjoy playing them. I think they're very powerful. I think they're probably my favorite faction. I've had some really fun games with them, so I'm going to give them full marks. All right. For a full review of these South American tribes, where I uh, say all sorts of more nice things about them, and some other Native American factions, as well as all the other nationalities and other factions from different nationalities, you can go over to pluginpigment.com and check out all our articles there. Besides nationality faction, uh, reviews, we have articles on ships, uh, terrain building, painting guides, and plenty of battle reports. Go check it out there. This has been another Blood and Pigment Faction Review. Keep your dice at the ready and the wind at your back.